All right. All right, does anybody have an elevation for the water level they want to give me? And how'd you get that, Jenna? I took the elevation of the land surface and added the height of the well, and then I subtracted the depth. And that was 31 what? 21.58. All right. Okay. So that is a measurement of the total amount of energy of that water. We could convert that to joules per meter cubed. Let's do it. You guys do it. Convert this now. This is in feet. Convert it to joules. Per meter cubed. Remember, I'll give you a hint. Remember that Rho G H is joules per meter cubed. But you might need to put H in a sane unit. You might not, you might not want H to be based on somebody's foot. Yeah, I think it's 3.25. 3.28 All right. 
right, so how'd you get it, Mark? Um, I took the height, converted it to meters. So three, one. So I the, the elevation by two, two one, five, eight feet times 3.28 feet per meter. How many meters did you get? Okay. Then I took that and just put it into the row GH. Well, uh, okay. So, so row is one thousand kilometer uh, kilograms per meter cubed. Gravity is nine point eight one meters per second squared. And that equaled what? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, nine, nine point three four times ten to the six. That doesn't. Anybody else get that? Whatever. Remember, joule is force times distance. Force is mass times acceleration. So kilogram times acceleration meter per second squared times meter, so a joule is kilograms meters squared per second squared. It does, yeah. We did the dimensional analysis already. Okay, cool. So that is awesome. We can take a tape measure and we can calculate how much energy that water has in joules. Easy. All right. Now, rule number one of groundwater is that A, we can measure the total potential with its height. All right. We can break it up into pressure and we can break it up into elevation. All right. And then the second rule that we're going to get into right now is that water flows from high potential to low potential. Or if we're measuring it via head, from high head to low head. All right. Water flows. from high potential to low potential. And I can easily just put in head here. Instead of potential. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna now learn the fundamental law. All right, Darcy's law for groundwater, and this is major, major. All right, we are gonna use Darcy's law all the time, all the time. All right. So here is the history of Darcy, all right? 
Well, actually, before we get to Darcy, let's go back to our um, let's go back to our thought experiment. All right. Now that we know a little bit more about fluid potential and driving things. What do you guys think now? Now that you know a little bit more about fluid, what, is the discharge the same or is it higher or lower in these two setups? We had arguments for the same and we had arguments for this one being the right hand side being higher last time. Let me ask you this. If H1 is equal to H1 and H2 is equal to H2 on both sides, the change in potential or the change in total amount of energy is the exact same for both setups. Is that, can you guys see that? The total change in potential here is exactly the same, all right? So actually the discharge is gonna be the same. It's just that it's configured in different ways. Here, I have a lot of pressure energy at the bottom of my column and not as much elevation energy, but I have the same amount of total energy. When I discharge here, my energy's all in elevation. When I come out of the column, most of my energy now is in elevation energy and not as much in pressure energy. Conversely here at the top of the column, I have a lot of elevation energy, but I don't have much pressure energy, all right? And when I exit the column, I don't have much elevation energy, but I have a lot of pressure energy. The bottom line is the total amount of energy difference between these two setups is exactly the same. And so if the sand is the same, we should expect the same discharge. And that is essentially what Darcy showed. He did an experiment. And so Darcy was a civil engineer, all right? And he was tasked with designing a drinking water system for the town of Dijon, France. And what we knew at that time, this is back in the 1800s, we knew that if you, um, if you took, we knew that we got, we didn't know what caused it, but we knew if we drank surface water, we got sick, all right? And we also knew that if we flowed that surface water through sand, you wouldn't get sick anymore, all right? So his job was to figure out, I got to supply a whole town with clean drinking water. How, and I'm going to do it by filtering it with, through sand. How big of a sand pit basically do I need to make in order to accommodate the amount of water I need to, to provide drinking water to this town? And so he set up an experiment. He's like, well, I better measure how much discharge comes out of a sand column. All right, and what he, what he found out was, so he set up a sand column, a lot like our, our experiment. So he had a sand column. I'm gonna tilt it so we can, I don't know how he actually did it, but usually we draw it tilted. So he set up a sand column And he had a reservoir of water here that went into this sand column. And it had a constant water level in it. And then he had a reservoir down here.
and it had a constant water level in it and it had an outlet. All right, and so what he measured was Q And he, so he measured Q, which was the discharge. In volume per time. All right. And he kept track what he, what, what Darcy noticed was that Q would change depending on the difference in the height of the water entering the sand column and leaving the sand column. Let's, uh, and we're gonna say this is L the length of the sand column. All right, so what Darcy, what Darcy found was that the discharge, all right, was linearly related to the difference in height. So H1 minus H2, the difference in height divided by the length of the column. All right, so he, 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 what Darcy first noticed was that if he changed how much higher this input column was, so if he, if he moved this water level up here, he would get higher discharge. If he moved this thing down, he would get lower discharge, all right? And then he found that, well, if I change the length of the column, if I kept this height the same, but I, but I shortened the column, I'd get more discharge. Or if I lengthened the column, I would get less discharge. So this, this is the head here, and this is the head here. Remember, these are measures of the total energy of the water. The difference in head divided by the length between those two head differences, we're gonna call the head gradient. And this is the like fundamental thing that we're gonna try and wrap our minds around. But the head gradient is the difference in the, in the total head between two points divided by the distance between those points. All right? So we're gonna call this the head gradient. All right, so Darcy's law is this. Actually, I'm not gonna use the deltas. I'm just gonna forgo that. We're gonna use little d's. K, A, we're gonna talk about what all of those are. I'm gonna put this negative sign here and it's gonna cause all kinds of consternation for the rest of the semester. But I'm gonna put it because otherwise I'm, I didn't write Darcy's Law the right way the first time. This is the equation, probably the equation we'll use the most in the class. So Q we've already defined, it's my discharge in volume per time. A is the cross sectional area
normal to the flow. All right, I used some fancy science terms there. What does normal mean? Normal means perpendicular. So here I've got my water is flowing from high head to low head. It's being forced through this column. So the water flow direction is like this, all right? The area perpendicular to that flow is the cross-sectional area of this tube. So this would be A here. It's perpendicular or normal to the flow path, all right? You're gonna, uh, one of the things we're gonna do all the time is calculate what's the total volume of water coming across an area, all right? It's always the area, the area will always be the area normal or perpendicular to the flow path, all right? DHDL, what we did is we took, we said, well, if, if, I'm, if I, I'm interested in the difference between the head at one point and the second point, and um, if I make, if I look at smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller spatial locations, then I get to this magic point where I turn to the derivative, which is the limit as that difference in position goes to zero. All right, so that's what this is. And so it's just the difference in head between two points separated by some difference in length DL. And if, if we bring it to its limit, as those two points get closer and closer together, then we would write it as a differential here. But we're gonna call DHDL, I'm gonna change back to white here, DH, DL, we're going to call that the high hydraulic gradient. And now K is called the hydraulic. conductivity. All right, let's put some units on this stuff. So Q is, let's do our unit. We'll do our units over here. So Q is length cubed per time, volume per time. What are the units of dH over dL? Right, it's a change in height, which would be the unit length over a change in length which would be the unit length. So it's, it's length over length, which is unitless. I'll put length over length, just so we know. It's, it's a change in height over a change in length. It's length over length. That is unitless, right? Those two cancel. What is the unit of area? So if I need if I need this term over here, so this goes, we can cancel these out. If I need this term over here to be, to, if I need the right-hand side to be length cubed over time to be equal to discharge, what do the units of K have to be? Length over time, right? If I put it this as length over time, then I get length cubed over time is equal to length cubed over time. All right, so hydraulic gradient. So this has the unit 
length squared. This is unitless. This has the unit length over time. And hydraulic conductivity is what we're going to spend the next week and a half of class thinking about subsurface properties and what controls them. But hydraulic conductivity is basically how it, it, it relates the hydraulic gradient to the discharge, all right? And what it is actually is a linear relationship. It says, what Darcy's law says is that if I, my, discharge is linearly related to my hydraulic gradient. And the thing that determines the slope of that linear relationship is my hydraulic gradient or my hydraulic conductivity, all right? The thing that determines the slope of my relationship between discharge and hydraulic gradient is my hydraulic conductivity. It's essentially a measure of how easy water flows through your, your uh, porous media, all right? And, um, or your rock. And, and it's the slope of the line if we were to plot discharge versus hydraulic gradient. So if I was to plot this is hydraulic gradient dh dl And this is discharge. So if I was to take Darcy's column and I was to keep measuring or keep changing the height of those two funnels and then measuring the change in the discharge. So my hydraulic gradient is equal to zero. What is my discharge? Zero. Super important fundamental thing right there. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a hydraulic gradient, you cannot have flow, all right? You don't get flow unless you induce a hydraulic gradient. The intercept of this line is zero. As I increase my hydraulic gradient, my discharge is going to increase. I'm gonna to have to deal with this negative sign at some point. We're not gonna go there yet. And this line it's a straight line. All right. The slope of this line, the slope M here would be equal to negative K A. That's what Darcy's law says. So if, if I have what we call a high hydraulic conductivity, so if my water flows really fast, or if I have a rock that, that will yield a lot of water, then my discharge rapidly increases as I increase gradient. So if I have a really high conductivity rock, I just have to increase my gradient a little bit and I'm gonna get a really high discharge. 
So this would be a high conductivity. Conversely, if I've got a low conductivity rock, then I've got to really crank up my head gradient in order to get any discharge at all. So this would be a low conductivity rock. All right, and, and green is some middle value. Okay, so this is Darcy's law. It's our fundamental law that we're gonna work with a lot in groundwater. All it really says is that my discharge out of the tube is linearly related to the gradient in the head between the two points, all right? And remember that head gradient is really just the gradient in energy, right? So all it says is, hey, guess what? The discharge in groundwater is equal to the energy gradient. It's not mind blowing. And in fact, it's a very engineering way to approach it. We make a measurement, we find a line and we put a fudge factor on there. All right. Now, easy, groundwater is so easy. It's a simple linear relationship, done. Here's the rub. Hydraulic conductivity is a real bear, all right? And it varies massively, all right? So we talked about this in day one in class, but I can easily have my hydraulic conductivity vary eight orders of magnitude, all right? From me walking to the speed of light, no problem. That happens in the mountain, in Mount Sentinel, all right? We would see easily eight orders of magnitude between a fracture and the adjacent rock. So we don't know what it looks like underground. We can't see underground. We don't know what the distribution of hydraulic conductivity is. And so our task as hydrogeologists is to start to use our knowledge of geology, of fluid dynamics, and of, of the how rocks are made to understand this um, to understand K, where, where K is going to be high, where K is going to be low, how do we measure it, all right? So what we're going to do now um, is start delving into subsurface properties of rocks that control groundwater flow, all right? And start thinking a lot about hydraulic conductivity how we know what controls it and what doesn't. Um, before, we, before we go there, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce a couple things here. Um, okay, so we've written Darcy's Law as a, uh, as Q is equal to negative K A D H D L. And Q I've said is my discharge, which is the volume per time. All right. I'm gonna write, first of all, I wanna define a flux. So what does anybody, in, when I talk in physics, what is a flux? Anybody know? It has a very specific definition in physics. You got a couple things right. Doesn't have to be energy A, it's, it's, it, it's, there's a flow of something. It's a flow of, it's a flow of so, so first of all, let's think about let's think about what this discharge is, and let's imagine we've got some plane. Well, let's 
actually, let's just go back to our, before we have reimagined the wheel, let's go back to our column. And we've got this, we've got this disc, right? And water is flowing across my disc. So my disc has some area and I've got Q, I've got a discharge of water across that area. All right, so the discharge is the total amount of water that comes out of this area, all right? The flux, flux means the, the flow or the discharge of any unit it can be energy, it can be carrots, it can be water, doesn't matter. We can, we can calculate a flux of whatever the hell we want. It is the flow per unit area. So flux here would be the Q divided by A. Let's look at the units of that. Flux, volume per time, length cubed per time, divided by length cubed. Sorry, length squared. <laughs> That's going to be length per time. So this, so I'm going to, I'm going to call this, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to give this a special name. This kind of flux is Darcy flux. But we can calculate a heat flux. We can calculate a chemical flux. We can calculate a flux of whatever we want. All a flux means is the discharge of some thing per unit area perpendicular to the flow. All right. We can calculate an electromagnetic flux, whatever, all right? So flux for us here, Darcy flux is the discharge divided by the area. Darcy flux is gonna be really, really useful for us as hydrologists, because as groundwater hydrologists. Because groundwater, unlike surface flow, like if we're looking at flow through a river, it's very easy for us to define the cross-sectional area of the river and say, oh, all the flow is going across this. When we're in a groundwater system, the thing's huge. And we don't know what the total discharge might be, but we can calculate the flux really easily. So the flux, I can rewrite Darcy's law here by dividing by the area. Q is equal to Q over A, which is equal to negative K BH BL. So I've just divided, I've just divided by A, and this Q here is my Darcy flux. All right, it's equal to my discharge per unit area. And now I've gotten rid of the A essentially, I've hit it in little q. And I can write Darcy's law as q is equal to negative k dhdl. All right. So one of the things that we're going to do, we'll do this a lot, and we'll keep practicing it in class. Moving from calculating total discharge, what you often almost always are going to get in, in groundwater is we'll, we'll know a flux between two points. We'll know the head gradient, we'll know the hydraulic conductivity, and then we want to scale it up and figure out, okay, if, if the flux is constant, what is the total discharge coming out of this area here? So being able to go from flux to discharge is really important. What I want you guys to do right now is just understand what flux is. It's just the discharge per unit area. We just normalized it by the area. And we can rewrite Darcy's now in this other way. Okay, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, 
we will rock on porosity and looking at porous media on Tuesday and start thinking about subsurface properties on Tuesday. Uh, any questions? All right. Well, if not, have a good weekend. Uh, and we will see you guys on Tuesday.